that because we've worked hard and been through things and emotional, just, just getting the church off the ground. And so uh, uh, I, I said to uh, the secretary, you can find me Mike Warnke. And I said, he's out there somewhere. I don't even know if he's still alive. I remember saying, I don't even know if he's still alive, you know. But uh, he, he made me laugh when I first got uh, uh, born again. Uh, the first time, not the second time I got born again, but the first time. I'm just working with you. Make sure you all with me tonight. Okay. And then, uh, and then Mike came, and uh, my son, uh, Judah, at the time was, uh, you know, he's just a young man. Uh, I'm guessing he was uh, eight years old or so. And we were at the airport, and I said, son, he's going to be a pudgy-looking fellow with long hair. You know, that's all I could tell Judah. And, uh, and I walked away, and Mike comes out, and I find him, but I can't find Judah. And he'd already found my son, hid my son from me. And I'm, I'm panicking all over the airport trying to find him. Well, since Mike has gone off the rope course with us, he, he's been on Harleys with me. He's done a lot of things with me. So tonight I'd like to simply introduce him. Uh, would you welcome my friend Mike? <laughs> I got it turned on. Have you got me turned on? No, it's Mike. I always like to come to Texas. I usually get turned on here. Okay, Mike. We got We got. We're gonna leave the kids in tonight. So let's watch oh, this. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, if mean, those I'm, watching us tonight, old, I'm not dead. <laughs> those watching us tonight on HolyWild.tv, I appreciate you guys tuning in and watching and. Uh, uh, and please tell somebody else about it so it'll keep progressing. And if my mother's watching tonight, Mom, I don't know this guy. <laughs> Jerry's mom. Jerry's responsible for everything I do. I, I call him and I clear every single solitary joke, every single solitary word. He signs off on every bit of it. Uh, there's a whole lot of this stuff that I do, that I do, I really don't want to do, but Jerry, he wants it done, and he hadn't got the guts to do it himself, so, <laughs> you know, uh, he, he, he has some stuff on me, and so I don't really have a whole lot of choice, it's just, uh, you know, it's the fellowship by intimidation is what it is, and uh, I just always thought that's better than no fellowship at all, amen, <laughs> hallelujah. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's official. Now, you know, I don't, you know, people go, mm, man, I'm not feeling, I, I'm, I'm not feeling so good, you know. I'm not feeling so good. I think I got the flu. And people say that, you know. I'm not feeling so good. I think I got the flu. Well, what makes you think you got the flu? Well, I've got these body aches. And I've got a cough. And I've got this runny nose. I think I've got. I'm down at Goliad, which, by the way, if any of my friends at Goliad are listening tonight, thank you for a wonderful time. But I tell you what, if you go to Goliad, Texas, you got a purpose in your heart <laughs> to go to Goliad, Texas. Because <laughs> Goliad isn't on the way to any place. I don't even know how the Mexicans found it so that the Texans beat them down there. You know what I mean? I don't know why there was a battle there. I don't know how anybody found the place. Amen? San Jacinto, okay, I get that. The Alamo, that's San Antonio. I get it. Goliad, Texas, thank you very much. It's a wonderful place, nice and quiet. There ain't nothing happening because there ain't nothing happening. Uh, I says to the clerk when I checked into the hotel, I came down on Thursday. Nothing wrong. I felt great. And I got all checked in. And, I, you know, by the time I got checked in, I realized that there wasn't hardly any, you know, sit-down dinner places to eat at because most places close up, you know. So I knew, well, you know, you've always got your fast food stuff. And so, <coughs> wow. Wow. <coughs> <laughs> wow, that was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, television land. And anyway, so, uh, um. So, so I says to the guy uh, at the desk, I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to go get, a, you know, McDonald's. I said, so where's McDonald's? And he went, what? I said, McDonald's. McDonald's? 
I said, yeah, where's the McDonald's? What McDonald's? I said, the M McDonald's here in Goliad. He says, closest McDonald's is in, is in Victoria. That's 37 miles away. I said, y'all don't have a McDonald's? No. You got a Wendy's? No. I said, what do you got? We got a Whataburger and a Dairy Queen. And Dairy Queen's brand new. And I went, well, I said, what about a supermarket? No. Don't have a supermarket. No, we got a little corner market down there. It turned out to be one of them things at a gas station, you know, like that. About the only thing you can get is those six-day-old sandwiches with green tuna in them. <laughs> and I can get real hungry, but I ain't never been that hungry. You know what I'm saying like that? Oh, so anyway, so I'm in Goliad, and, and uh, everything's fine. Uh, I preached, uh, got there Thursday, preached Friday night. Uh, going to preach Saturday evening. Uh, went out Saturday morning, had lunch with Pastor and him, and all's good. And about Saturday afternoon, man, it started getting ugly. But I went and preached anyway. And uh, then I got home from preaching that night, and I took the top off a bottle of water. And I'm telling you, I was shaking so hard that the water was sloshing out of the bottle. I couldn't. You know, I mean, it's just like. It's like I was like playing tag team with the Bible. <laughs> Did you get any? I got a few drops, you know. It's like being outside and it's only sprinkling and you're running around trying to drink the rain, you know. So uh, Sunday morning came, I got up, got a shower, went across, and I preached Sunday morning. By the time I got back, I was wiped out again. I slept all that day and all the rest of that day, all that evening, got up the next morning and drove down here, sweating like a horse, got here. Well, uh, I got here, and, and uh, I'd called Miss Peggy and said, <coughs> she said, I guess you're not feeling too good. I am so you notice how men forget how to talk when they get sick, you know? That's about all we say, you know? So uh, I said, could you, I have seriously asked her, could she find me a doctor to go to? So I went to the doctor, and I went there, and they tested me. Have got any of you had the flu? Have any of you been tested for the flu? They take a pipe cleaner looking thing <laughs> and they jam it clear up into your sinus and then they take them a big swab, you know what I mean, and pull that out. She said, now this may make you sneeze. I said, this is going to make me bleed. This ain't going to make me sneeze. And then she pulled it out and let out this blue one. I didn't even, you know, it's like I didn't even have a chance to go like that. I said, you know. I said, I'm sorry. She said, that happens all the time. And then she got this candle I saw and she went, so I guess that was supposed to make us all feel better, you know. That's something you get used to when you have the flu. People that you, people, the word goes out, especially if you're me, and you got a wife like mine that tells everything on Facebook, amen. She showed a picture of me today of me sitting and talking to my daughter's pet pig named Wilbur, and she put on there that I was testing a sermon with that pig. And several people wrote and said, did the pig get saved, you know? <laughs> and she wrote and said, he's already saved. He's a kosher pig. Anyway, so <laughs> if you slice a ham off of him, you don't get ham, you get tuna fish. But anyway, you know, and uh, one of my friends wrote back and said, well, there's a problem right there, swine flu. But anyway, <laughs> and another friend wrote and he said, no, the swine didn't flu. He's still right there, see? <laughs> He'll be right there till pigs fly. Oh, man, I got some weird friends. <laughs> anyway, so, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, you got to get used to that. You know, I get to where I'm going, and people know I got the flu, and they go, hi, Brother Mike, good to see you. <laughs> really love you. Good to have you here, you know, and so you got to get used to that. People walking around, hands down, you candle I saw. You get used to that sound, laying asleep at night, and all you hear, tss. But it's official. I don't have maybe flu. I don't have perchance flu. 
I don't have, I might have the flu. I got the flu, okay? <laughs> I got the, I'm taking Tamiflu, flu, flu. I got the flu, I got the flu, I got the flu. <laughs> but it's not like it used to be when we were kids. For example, I don't have to stay real close to a pot. <laughs> and the flu when we had, when we had a kid, man, you were like, you, my mom used to just chain my leg to the toilet, you know. <laughs> Don't come out of there until you're well, you know. <laughs> now, that, that, this flu doesn't act like that. And, and I don't remember coughing with the flu. You know, I cough with a cold and stuff. But this stuff, man, I sound like I'm trying to throw up a lung. You know what I mean? I coughed real hard the other day, and my belly button went, hey. You know, went like that. <laughs> Somebody got a pill cut in your throat? No, it's my belly button. <laughs> My pants fell off because my stomach got, you know. Smooth <laughs> It was a sad thing, really. Oh, you know. You get that breeze. But anyway, so. So you got to have a sense of humor about this kind of stuff. Mama Susan said, honey, you want me to get you an airplane ticket and just bring you home because you really sound horrible. And I said, well, baby, I said, I'm not going to do that because, um, if the devil ever gets the idea he can make me sick and I'll stop preaching, uh, I'll never get well again. So the thing is, stuff happens, but you don't always have to give in to it. Sometimes it'll knock you down so hard it'll take you a while to get up, but you don't ever have to give up, you know. You get knocked down, but you can always get up. As long as you got breath in you, you can get up again, amen. And uh, as long as you get up, man, you can win the victory. And I'm telling you, Anything you can laugh at, the devil cannot hold over you. He, you can't, the devil can't beat you with anything you can laugh about. That's why somebody says, man, you make, you, make the, you, make, you make jokes about the weirdest things. That's the only way I know how to overcome. Preach the word and, and have a good time doing it, and I'll take the devil off worse than anything. So, so I just keep doing it. I just ask y'all to. For be it, forgive me for being a little standoffish. Y'all know I'm a hugging, kissing, cuddling kind of person, so we ain't going to be doing none of that tonight. <laughs> Not because I'm afraid of y'all, but to listen, you don't want none of this. Let me just, I'm just telling you, okay? So, so, and, uh, and I'm on this, uh, I'm on the Tamiflu and all that stuff. I tell you, man, you know, I've been thinking about these, these drugs and stuff. We all take, and the older you get, the more stuff you take. And, and it's like uh, when you start getting a certain age, you start taking a certain amount of pills every day. And uh, I take so many now, I feel like I could play a musical instrument in the band. I could be the maraca, you know. <laughs> I just shake, you know. I could be one of them big old gourds from Africa with the beans on it. like Because you know, you know, I take a lot of pills. The other day, I was looking at the literature that came with one of my medications. And uh, did you ever read the literature that comes with your medications? Oh. Never did? <laughs> well, well, this is the one that came with mine. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, right, this right here is the list of possible side effects. Possible side effects. I take this for one thing. But I could get nausea from taking this. I could get dizziness from taking this. I could get drowsiness from taking this. I could have a dry mouth. I could lose my appetite. I could have increased sweating. Oh, good. <laughs> That's what I need. I'm a, I'm a fat man anyway, you know. I can sweat in a snowstorm standing still. So what I need is increased sweating. I really do. You know what I mean? I need to sweat so bad I can s just wash my socks by walking. Anyway, I can get diarrhea. Oh, yeah, good. Phew, sign me up. I can have an upset stomach, and then I can have, a trouble, I can have trouble sleeping. So I can't even pass out and get over this stuff. Oh, yeah. It says uh, I could have uh, easy bruising and bleeding. And mus muscle cramps and weakness. I'm just waiting for my doctor to ask me how I am. <laughs> I'm just going to say, well, you know, that one thing, 
that I'm taking this pill for, that ain't too bad, but <laughs> I tell you, it's a mess. Anyway, so I'm trying to do my best to stay on top of stuff, and, and uh, I had a fella call me uh, from Bay City, where I'm going next, and uh, he said, uh, how you doing? I said, oh, I said you know, I, I'm doing much better today. I feel much better today. He said, well, he says, what are you, what, what are you making any decisions about the rest of the week? Because I'm supposed to be down there this weekend. He said, you making any decisions about the rest of the week? I know you want to kind of wait another day before you decide because I know it can be a little bit of a mom, mom. And I went, brother, I said, I'm preaching tonight. He went, I beg your pardon? I said, I'm preaching tonight, and I'm preaching tomorrow night, and then I'm going to lay down all day on Thursday, and I'll see you on Friday. Are you kidding me? I went, no, honey, if I'm lying, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm on my way, Bubba, because it's the only way. I, like I said, it's, you know, you can lay down and take it, or you can do your best to fight it, and you can just trust the folks around you understand if you're having a little bit of trouble with this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, that I, I just, I don't know. I just have never been real comfortable with making excuses to the Lord. You know, and I think one of the biggest problems that Christians have is, is and no offense, and if this doesn't apply to you, I, you know, I'm not trying to offend anybody. And if it does offend you, it, it probably does apply to you, so good on you. So. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I f I, haven't you ever noticed that, Dick? Only the people that get offended deserve it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> just saying. Uh, but the big problem in the body of Christ, there's several, but one, one of the big problems is excuses. You know, well, I don't pay my, my, my tithe because I don't have the money. I don't show up because I've got so many other things to do. And I don't get involved because I have such a busy life. And you know what I found out in my lifetime? Excuses are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple and they stink. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you can either live on faith or you can live by your excuses, but you can't do both things. Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't hold back on the Lord because you got some excuse to do so and expect to live in the fullness of what he has for you. Because one of the main things you have to understand is that obedience is the key to the blessings of God. Uh, let me explain what I'm saying. I don't know how many of you remember Charles Simpson. He was a preacher. Y'all all remember Charles Simpson? Okay, well, you don't, but that's all right. He was a, he was a, he was a, a, a he was a demon chasing man. You know, he would cast demon out of a fire plug, you know. He called it, he sort of thought everything was a demon, you know, he had demon to shove and he said he said there was this woman and she said every time she went by somebody at a swimming pool she had an uncontrollable urge to push him in and we just cast a demon to shove right out of her <laughs> a demon to shove give me a break and the, the demon of dandruff and the demon of bad breath it's not bad breath you need to brush your teeth amen <laughs> come on but anyway, he was a he was a good preacher, and, and uh, you know I didn't agree with everything he had to say, but I knew him for a while. And he was telling this story, and, and he said this. He said, "Well, he said uh, one night, he said uh, I was laying there in bed, I was laying there in bed, and my wife reached over and elbowed me, and she said, she said, honey, I hear something. He said, honey, you always hear something. She goes, no, Charles, this time I hear something. He goes, honey." You always hear something. She says, listen real quick. He listened. And he said, guess what? I heard something. He said, so I decided I'd see what was going on. So I got up. It was outside. I could tell it was in the yard. So I got up. You know what, brother? When you bend over like that, it, do it doesn't keep me from seeing you. I still see you. I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> you just look like this is all, you know. I'm just glad you wasn't leaving because this would have been my view. You know, it's not. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't walk in on a comedian without getting teased. I hope you're all right, and I hope you don't know any martial arts. Anyway, uh, 
I'm going to tease some, somebody one of these days, and they're not going to find it funny, and they're going to walk all over me. Hallelujah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Charles says, I got up, and I went over to the bedroom window, and I cracked them blinds or them drapes a little bit, and I looked out, and he said, sure enough, there was a guy sneaking across the yard, and he had on a, a ski mask. I went, whoa, we're in trouble. So he sh shut them. And then he said, uh, I went over to this other window. You know, this is a corner of the room. There's a window here and a window here. He said, I went over this other window. And he said, I pulled that aside to see maybe I could get a different view on the guy. And I, he said, but what I didn't know is the guy had seen me. And he'd seen me in that window. And he thought, I'll go over this other window. And I'll peek in through them drapes and see what that old boy's doing. So when I pulled the drapes back to look, <laughs> that guy was right there, you know. <laughs> I said, in the name of Jesus. He said, that guy jumped. He turned around and hit a nine-foot hurricane fence and bent it right to the ground. <laughs> and getting the heck out of there. He said, I went downstairs. I got on my face before the Lord, and I said, What's going on? Psalms 91 says, no evil nigh my dwelling, and I'd just like to know what's happening. That guy was evil, and he was nigh. And the Lord said, Charles, you remember a couple weeks ago when I told you to do that thing I told you to do? And uh, Charles said, yes, sir. He said, what did you tell me? I said, I'd, I'd, I'd get to it as soon as I could. And the Lord said, well, I'll take care of them bad guys as soon as I get around to it, okay? <laughs> he says, what you have to understand, Charles, is my blessing isn't where you are. My blessing is where I told you to be. He says, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, you're totally without my presence, but the fullness of my blessing is where you need to be, not where you are right now. So obedience is the key to the thing. We've got to do what God wants us to do if we expect to be in what I call the blessing way. And I don't think that blessings just happen. I think you have to get in the way of them sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think you have to put yourself in a place where you can get blessed. You know, people come to church, they get healed, and they go back out to the bar, and they wonder how come they don't keep their healing. Or, you know, you know, God didn't heal you so you could be more comfortable watching football on Sunday morning. Sorry. You know? God doesn't bless you so you can pile it up and buy yourself a bunch of shiny toys. It's not that God doesn't want, to have, want you to have shiny toys, but he wants, to be such a con there, he wants there to be such a confluence of giving in your life that the, that the, that the, the shiny toys are, are, are just the side effects. See, because he's got a longer list than I do. But you've got to put yourself in that blessing way. You've got to be in those places where you can get blessed. And God's very clear about how he wants us to live, you know. And I'm not talking about, oh, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't drive fast, you shouldn't cut, you know. I've heard all that all my life, you know. Well, you can tell I'm a Christian. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't dance, I don't sing, I don't laugh, I don't go to movies, I don't watch television, I don't look at the funny papers, I don't read books. If it looks good, I take it off. If it tastes good, I spit it out. Bless God, if you get saved, you can have all the fun I'm having. Won't you be blessed? <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how God wants us to live, not the things he doesn't want us to do, but the things he does want us to do. And one of the things he wants us to do is to be in fellowship. Amen. Now, he wants us to be in fellowship. Can I be a Christian without going to church? Yeah, you can climb Mount Everest in your underwear, too. What's your point? <laughs> it's not a matter what you can and can't do. It's what God is asking you to do. You need to be in church. You need to be in fellowship. You need to be part of a faith community. You need to be in a place where the brothers and sisters can come around you when you need some help. And you need to be in a place where when you're called on to get around somebody else, you can do that too. Amen. <coughs> it's all a part of walking out your Christianity, see? You need to spend time in the Word. You need to spend time in the Word. You need to spend time in the Word. Well, I got my book and I got my lessons. And I sit down every morning and I give the Lord 15 whole minutes. I go through that and everything like that. And it's just wonderful. 
Well, if that's all you can muster up time to do, fine. But I tell you what, the more time you spend in his presence, the more time you're going to have in his presence. And the more time you have in your pre- his presence, the more insight you're going to get. The more insight you get, the better you're going to be able to do this. The better you're able to do this, the more you're going to find yourself in a blessing way. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not saying. I'm just saying. You see what I'm saying? Oh, God. I don't even believe I... Lori, help me. I don't know how to get out of this. Anyway, so you need to spend time in the Word. You need to spend time in God's presence. You, need, and, you know, I heard uh, there's a statistic that says that 80% of preachers never spend any time in the Word of God unless they're writing a sermon. I don't know how, I don't know how you do that. Because there's a lot of times, man... I, I, I don't need to write a sermon. I just need a word. Uh, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't go out and shout boogie woogie and stand on one foot and, and, you know, fly to Kansas City to see what Mike Bickel has to say. Not that I got anything wrong with Mike. If I want a word from the Lord, though, I'm going to get somewhere with his word and I'm going to go through the word and I'm going to see what the word says about my situation first. Because everything after the word is just everything after the word. Amen. Somebody said, the Bible isn't everything, no, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place. That's all I say, you know. And, you know, we don't get the, we don't get the Holy Spirit so we can all, all go off and be a law unto ourselves. We get the Holy Spirit so that through the eyes of God we can understand the things that he's saying to us better. Amen? We need time and we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to set time aside and we need to pray. And, and and, and let me just say, uh, prayer is not always a list of things you want. You know? Prayer is not always a, a list of people you want saved. Uh, prayer is not just a list of things you want healed. Sometimes, sometimes, the best prayer you can say is thank you. Old Meister Eckhart said, if, you only, if the only prayer you ever pray is thank you, it'll be enough. Because the seedbed of humility is gratefulness. And God says he blesses the humble, you know. Hallelujah, amen. So we need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in the word. We need to go to church. We need to do these things. And as we do these things, God speaks to our heart and he tells us the other things that you know, I got a lot of friends that, you know, they say, well, I'll just tell you one thing right now. God is not in the fried chicken. <laughs> he isn't? No. God spoke to me, and he told me not to eat fried chicken anymore. Because you get addicted to fried chicken, and pretty soon you can't eat nothing but fried chicken, and all of a sudden you got the demon of Colonel Sanders on you. So I'll just tell you right now, it's ungodly to eat fried chicken. Well, brother, you know, I don't want you to eat fried chicken. Don't eat fried chicken, but don't turn it into a doctrine, for goodness sake. You just leave me alone because I like me some fried chicken, thank you. I'm a preacher. If I didn't get fed fried chicken, I'd die. Hallelujah. Fried chicken be the holy bird, man. There's a lot of chicken went into this ministry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I've eaten so much chicken. One day I was trying to pull up my jeans and I couldn't get them up over my hind end. I turned around in the mirror and I had tail feathers, you know. <laughs> they, were, they were growing there. Anyway, uh, so, uh, we, we, you know, we, we get ourselves in a situation where we spend our time worried about stuff that doesn't make any difference and then, then we let the things that are important get away from us, Amen. And uh, when I talk about the things God wants you to do, it's not that kind of thing, you know. It's the kind of thing where God says, love your neighbor. You know, he meant that, amen. When he said, forgive those who spitefully use you, he he meant that. He said, pray for your enemies, and he meant that. And, and, And I know you think to yourself, well, I'm not praying for my enemy because he's my enemy for a reason, bless God. And I'm not going to waste none of my prayers on him because he doesn't deserve a one of them. When you pray for your enemy, did you know it's not for your enemy's sake? It's for your sake. Do you know when you forgive somebody, it's not for their sake? It's for your sake. 
Because most of the people you're ticked at don't even know you're ticked at them. And if they did, they wouldn't care. And so the only person getting an ulcer because there's something going on is you. Get over it. Get on with it. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a hard saying, brother. I know that. I know that. That's why so many people like to just, you know, not do the things they think they're not supposed to do. Because it's easier to give up something. You know, I'm going to give up smoking. That's not easy, but you can do it, right? I'm going to give up drinking. That's not easy either, but you can do it. But I'm going to give up wearing neckties. That's easy, you know. And there's so many different things in so many different places. So many different churches have so many different rules and regulations. It's mind-boggling, amen? And if you tried to give up everything everybody wants you to give up, you would disappear from the face of the earth. I'm just saying. It'd be like living in a black hole. Poof, you'd be gone, you know. I gave up everything. Boom, you know. But, you know, when you got a real set of rules and regulations every morning, you can get out that, li- well, I don't want to touch any of these. No, I said, I'll get just this here. This is going to be nasty. I'm not going to be able to use this anymore. Anyway, but, you know, you, gotta, you, know, you, can, you can get out your list, and you can check it every morning. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. i got about 75% of that going on. I have to work on these other 25%. But I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm doing pretty good. And, you know, next day you can look at it and say, oh, well, look at there. I'm about up to 80%, Sam. And I, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm going to do all right. You know, I fit in. Yes, I call myself a Baptist because I've got, got the rules right here. I want to use those rules over there. If I, if I use those rules, I'll be Catholic. And <laughs> not sure I want to do that, you know, so. Oh, and the middle rules, they're, kind of, they're kind, of, kind of wavy, right? And the middle rules, those are for Pentecost. <laughs> having the rules and having a list, that's a pretty easy way to go. But when you start having to do things like love your neighbor, I mean, yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, pray for your enemies, forgive if you expect to be forgiven. All the do things that there are, there's no list for that. There ain't any list for that. You can't check that off a list anywhere. And that's the kind of stuff that's got to come from your heart. It can't come from your closet or from your medicine cabinet or from your makeup drawer. You know, some, I I tell this story all the time because I think it's the funniest thing. And and people say, that's a funny joke. The problem is it's not a joke. It really did happen. A little lady came up to me one night. And, How much makeup should a Christian woman wear, brother? I said, I don't know. It depends on your face. <laughs> My motto's always been, if you need to paint the barn, paint it. Because you know as well as I do, a good coat of paint's all keeping some of them old barns up, you know. But the point I'm trying to make, if you think that you can draw a line through the love of God with a tube of lipstick, I mean, you know, come on now. You know what I'm saying? Come on. It's, 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 a, it's an entirely different thing when, when in your heart you feel a compulsion to live in a certain way, to... to to walk the story of grace, to be, to be a person that people can look at and say, now there's a child of God. And you know what? It doesn't matter how much makeup you wear. It doesn't matter if you favor cowboy hats or stocking caps or ball caps. It doesn't matter if you like country music or some other kind of music. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're a Catholic or a Baptist or who you are. If you got those compulsions in your heart, That's the thing that makes you a real believer in Jesus Christ, a real journeyer with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And buddy, on this journey, you need the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you know how glad I am that I'm a Christian when I'm as sick as I am? I mean, Jerry told you there's thousands of people praying for me. Do you realize what I'd be like if those people weren't praying for me? Somebody said, well, they're praying for you, but you ain't healed. Do you realize what I'd be like if I wasn't being prayed for? Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody said, you're weird. I go, yeah, this is after salvation. Just <laughs> think, of what I'd, think of what I'd been like if I hadn't gotten saved. Oh, my God, you know. 
It's all relative, amen? Well, here's the thing, okay? People think they can be justified by the law, and honey, you can't be. I'll tell you something else. The law can be interpreted. You know what I'm saying? So what's the law to you may not be the law to me. Back when I was a young boy coming up in Catholic Church, the law was we ate fish on Friday. There's a good reason for it. It was supposed to be a fast day so that we would remember that Friday was the day that the Lord lost his life. And Sunday was always supposed to be a celebration because that's the day we remember that Jesus raised from the dead, you know. It wasn't a, it wasn't a bad thing, but it had gotten to be such a thing that it was a, it was a law. And, if you, and if, you, if you forgot to eat fish on Friday or you didn't eat fish on Friday, then Saturday you had to go to church, you had to go to confession, you had to get forgiven. So you were good enough then to go to communion Sunday because you couldn't approach the communion with a sin on your heart. Well, you know what? That's biblical. The Bible says, you know, search your heart to show yourself approved, you know. It was years before, that, years after that, that I realized I could just sit there just before communion and say, Lord, look, I know I'm not perfect and I've messed up many a time, but I'm going to go to your table because I need the healing that comes from going there, you know? Amen. But that's a, that's a change. I'm just talking about law. I, I know a brave, I moved up the mountain of ten, uh, Kentucky and I went to this Baptist church and I said, I'd like to come to your church. And the guy said, just fine. And I said, I'm a minister, and I'd be glad to help you out with anything that uh, you might need any help with. I said, just free of charge. If, if I'm home, I travel for ministry. I said, but if I'm home and if you need me to help counsel or do marriage counseling or anything like that, I'd be glad to help you. He said, I'd love to have you. We just need to get you baptized. I said, what do you mean? I said, I've been baptized. He said, not in our church you haven't. I said, sir, I said, I was baptized in the Jordan River. <laughs> Top that, <fat>, yeah. <laughs> I got wetter than you, God. I, you know? He said, well, I'm sorry. He said, we don't let anybody do anything in our church unless they're baptized in our church, in our water. I thought he meant in the Baptist church. He meant in his church right there. It's a law. It was a law. By the time I was baptizing with some folks, and uh, we were baptizing these folks, and all of a sudden one of the preachers came up and said, are you baptizing in Jesus' name? And I said, yep. All right, then. In the name of Jesus and the Father and the Son. In the name of Jesus and the Father and the Son. But these people feel that you should only be baptized in Jesus' name. And if you're not baptized in Jesus' name only, you're going to hell. Then there's another group that thinks if you haven't been baptized, you're going to go to hell. That the only thing that makes you saved is being baptized. My auntie belongs to that group. She said, I don't believe in a thing you do. And I'm worried you're going to go to hell. I said, honey, I was baptized in your church when I was five years old. She said, well, you're all right then. I didn't bother her to tell her about all that marijuana, you know. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been, I already done smoked six semi-loads of dope, but I was okay because I was baptized in the right water. Am I making my point here or am I just beating a dead horse? The law can be interpreted. You know, thou shalt not steal. That can be interpreted. Even thou shalt not kill. Well, there are righteous reasons to kill. That can be interpreted. There's righteous reasons to steal. If you really want to get down to it, that can be interpreted. You know? I, I had a guy say, I said, you know, you shouldn't be covetous all the time. He said, that's the only way we make progress. Greed is good. That can be interpreted. But you know what? Grace cannot be interpreted. Grace is grace. Amen. Grace is coming in. Grace is going out. Grace is grace. Amen? And the people who walk a story of grace have got something going on in the inside, not just on the outside. 
And you know what? That grace and that surety of that grace, that's the seedbed of all humor that Christians should have. Because as long as you know the grace of God has got you covered, buddy, you can laugh at just about anything, even the flu. One of these side effects I didn't, I didn't read because I was, uh, I was thinking I might offend everybody. One of them is, is uh, increased gas. <laughs> increased gas. You know, I'm 68 years old and I already got plenty. <laughs> if I get any more, I'm going to rent myself out to j Bo and he's going to hang me over the back of his bass boat and I'm going to get him across the lake. You know? I'm just saying, you know, to give a whole new meaning to outboard motor, you know. <laughs> oh, man. I'm so thankful for Jesus, y'all. I'm so thankful I'm a Christian. And I feel in my heart so sad for those that don't know him. I don't know how in the world you can get through this life without a sense of humor. And I don't know how you can have a real sense of humor if you don't know Jesus. Because if you don't know Jesus, you can't have a surety of that grace that gives you the peace and gladness in your heart that bubbles out as humor. You see? I mean, you see comics on TV. They're either bitter or mean or they make fun of people or they got to use vulgar words because if you use vulgar words, you embarrass people and people laugh to cover their embarrassment. That's not real joy. That's not real humor. That's not real fun. No, you got to have that surety of grace. You got to have that, that bed of rock to build your house on. Glory to God. That's what gives you the ability to have that humor. That could... Yeah, I'm going to keep coming over there. No, no, yeah. Why don't, you should get you one of the masks, okay? That's nice. She said, love you. Go over there. <laughs> Breathe on whole batter. He's got the faith. <laughs> That's funny. I'm going to use that. <laughs> You're going to show up on a record. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, that that's, I'm sorry. Anyway. I probably ought to get back up here. I wasn't going to do this because I am sick and all. <laughs> I was, I, everybody's been listening to me on television because I've been down there and they can't, they can't record me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I, and it's, it's not that I don't believe that we need to get saved. Don't, don't, don't go away from here thinking that Brother Mike said that everything's just okay. Because we're lost without him. We are. We're lost without him. And there comes a point, and I don't care who you are, and I don't care whose rules you're following, or what color you are, or what language you speak, what state you live in. There comes a point where you have to face your life and say, where do I go from here? And if you're smart, that's when you look at Jesus and say, well, I'm going to go with you. Now, that ain't going to make you perfect. Ain't going to make you perfect at all. It's just going to give you something to stand on when you fight the battles you have to fight and you face the things you have to face. And you fall down and you need the power to get up. That's what Jesus is for. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. You know? And you haven't got a chance until you're alive. And until you know that life, you don't have life. Until you know that love, you'll never know love. You can, look, you can know some facsimiles, but until you know the love of God, you will never know love. You will never know real love, ever. And believe me, there are plenty of substitutes out there. You'll never know joy. Substitutes, yeah, not joy. And you'll never have that assurance that rests in the heart of a true believer that the grace of God is here. And my Lord is going through all of it with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. With me. 
Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says it this way. It says, everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who does that mean? It means all of us. It means everybody's got to get saved. Big people got to get saved. Little people got to get saved. Fat people need to get saved. Short, uh, skinny people need to get saved. Rich people need to get saved. Poor need, people need to get saved. Old people need to get saved. Young people need to get saved. Boy people need to get saved. Girl people need to get saved. In short, everybody needs to get saved. Everybody needs to get saved. So when you figure that, then you realize there's only two kinds of people in the world. People that are saved, people that aren't yet. But the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, because all real change happens in your heart. You know, doesn't happen in your closet or your makeup or whatever. It happens in your heart. It says he, he came to take out of you the heart of stone and put into you the heart of flesh. So everything starts in your heart. So if you believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, in other words, if you're walking with Jesus, you need to make it obvious. You need to make it, you don't have to be a pain in the neck about it. <laughs> Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. You just witness to everybody. Glory to God. You go in, in that restaurant and they wait on you. Don't give them old filthy money. Leave them a gospel track. That'll be a great witness. You imagine somebody's got three kids trying to raise them on a waitress's salary. And she serves a table full of 10 people who've just come from a Bible conference, and all she gets is $4 and 16 Bible tracts. Do you think she's going to go home saying, Hallelujah, Jesus? <laughs> Not right away, she isn't. Hallelujah. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. I'd say confess with your life that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just a Lord, but my Lord. Not just the Lord, but my Lord. And you'll be saved. Believe in your heart, confess your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Not you might be saved, you could be saved, you should be saved. We'll find out when we get to heaven you're saved. You will be saved. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's where people come to a screeching halt. I can usually do that a little longer, but tonight my throat's just not. Like, you know, so. It's like I've got a resident hairball. Anyway. And this here is hairspray. I, it's the only thing I could use for substitute Lysol. I, I get a big Lysol one. That's kind of funny right there. I don't care who you are. Anyway. <laughs> Susan does that to me, and I come out of the bathroom, she goes, oh, God, you know, I don't even have to wear cologne anymore, because everything I got smells like pine salt, anyway, anyway, <laughs> Dick cracks me up, he saw me, and he started laughing, he hadn't stopped yet, I love you, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. Forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We think we've got to roll this big roll of paper down the driveway, and we get down there on our knees with a piece of paper, and a pen, I mean with a, a, a marker, marker, yeah, and we start writing down our sins, and we've got to do regression therapy until we get to be you know, sometimes in vitro because we probably sinned while we were in the womb. I've actually heard that. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Anyway, so, and you got to remember everything and you got to write it all down. And if you miss one, up the creek. Do you really think you got to tell God what you did wrong? No. He was there when you did it. You mean he was there when I, mm-hmm, and he saw me when I, yeah, in the back seat, of, yes, 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 he saw you, and the mystery is he loves you anyway. He says, while you were yet a sinner, he gave his life for you. Woohoo! that's good news right there, amen? 
Some may say, well, I'll never clean my life up enough to be a Christian. I know. That's why you need Jesus. He'll take care of all that for you. Amen. See, when you confess your sins, you're telling God you know you're a sinner. You know how they say, well, if you, if you, can, if you can confess the facts, that's half the battle. You know? Well, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to the Lord, if you confess the facts, that's all the battle. Because when you tell the Lord about your sins, you don't say, I did this, I did that. You say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. David was a man after God's own heart. And every time David had a chance, he disobeyed the Lord. You know what made David a man after God's own heart, brother man? He knew how to say, I'm sorry and mean it. I said, <coughs> he knew how to say, I'm sorry and mean it. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins. Doesn't talk about a 12 step program. It doesn't talk about making amends. It doesn't talk about going back and making peace with those you've wronged. Hey, dude, I've been there, done that, you know? Not, not having any, not having any, any issue with friends, Bill W. But when you confess and when you say, I'm sorry, that's all that's needed. That's all that's needed. He says, I stand at the door and I knock, and anyone who will open that door, I'll come into them and sup with them and never leave them. Well, you know what? You just need a crack because the truth of the matter is the Lord's trying to figure out ways to get you in. He's not looking for loopholes to keep you out. The whole idea of sending his son to die on the cross is so we could all come home. Amen? Not so that we could all. Do you think that God would sacrifice his only son and then make that whole sacrifice worthless by making it so hard that nobody could receive it? That is ridiculous. Ridiculous. He loves us. He wants us. He sent his son to die for us. And once we receive Jesus... And once that spirit is working in our life, and once we get it in our head that we are the children of grace, then the whole thing changes. Doesn't make us perfect. Doesn't mean we won't ever have any more problems. Doesn't mean we won't fall down, skin our knees, make mistakes. Stuff won't happen in our lives that are not supposed to happen. It just means we have that platform now. We have that place to stand and laugh at the devil. That place to stand and whistle in the dark. Amen. And that's what the world lacks. They don't have any place to stand. And the way the world is, the ground keeps shifting under us all the time, Brother Jerry. Now, I would assume on a Tuesday night, in this lovely church, that most of y'all already know the Lord. But I'd be a miserable evangelist if I didn't come to a point where I gave those of you that might not know the Lord a chance to receive him. It's just a matter of saying yes, and if you need some help doing it, I'd be glad to help. All these people in this church house, they'd be glad to help. Trust me when I tell you, everybody in this room tonight wants you to succeed. Everybody in this room. Everybody in this room wants to see you in heaven. Everybody. Everybody here. And for those of you that are watching tonight, Jesus loves you. And as we're gathered together here and you're gathered with us, what I'm saying to these folks applies to you. There's not a soul around here that doesn't want to see you succeed. There's not a soul around here that wants you to be lost or that wants to see you die without salvation. Everybody here 
most of all, it's what Jesus wants for you. But there's a step to take. Say yes to the Lord. So if you're here tonight, you've never prayed a sinner's prayer. You've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. Maybe you've been in church all your life. You've just never done that. Or maybe you've gone to a church where they didn't really emphasize that. If you're here tonight, we need it. If you're out there tonight, there in the world, big wide world, and you need it, amen, we're going we're gonna to do that. Let's, everybody bow your heads. Just, just say this with me. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I failed you in a lot of ways. But Lord, you said, if I would ask forgiveness, that you'd forgive me. So right now, Lord, I ask for that forgiveness. And I thank you so much for keeping your promise to me. Now, Lord, come into my life and be my personal Savior. Make me new. Make me whole. But more than anything, teach me to love the way you love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I said to a really great man whom I respect deeply, Christian leader, I said, at this time in my life, what should I do? I've been doing this for over 40 years, 43 years I've been on the road. What should I do? And this leader said, Son, do what you do. God gave you the grace to accomplish a certain task. And you know, my number one job in life, along with everything else I do, is to give people an opportunity to accept Jesus. Is there anybody here tonight, and I know that at this point this might feel a little awkward, but it's all right. Is there anybody here tonight that maybe prayed that for the first time or, or maybe renewed by praying it again? You've been kind of out there somewhere. If you, would you raise your hand if you have? Praise the Lord. We see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Praise the Lord. Before you leave tonight, if you could do me a favor, I'd appreciate it. If you could see Dick or if, uh, Dick or, or J-Bo or Pastor or somebody here at the church just so they'll know your name so they can pray for you and get a handshake remember I said you need to come to church and if you don't have anywhere to go to church this would be a good place I wouldn't tell you that if I didn't trust these people and if you don't live around here Jerry will know some place near where you do live where you can go but you need to do that okay there's a bunch of you there's seven of you what a wonderful thing Makes you glad that you fight through the flu on some nights. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift his countenance up upon you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you. God bless you guys. Thanks for standing for me coming up. I'm really honored. And <laughs> a little bit, a little bit bashful about it, but be be seated, okay? I can't take much. You know, I am. Um, my humility can only go so far. If I could get our servant leaders to come up. Hey, uh, he's a very humble man. He actually got an award for being humble. It was a humble button, but they took it away from him because he wore it. Hey, uh. Robert, turn his mic off.
What, what's he, you, you know when he walk away, you turn your mic off, you know. What's up with that? If you need a, a tithe or offer, an offering envelope, put an uh, extra offering tonight. You understand your tithe, but we need extra. I really do need to get Mike to Bay City. If not, he'll stay here. So we, we want to send him away the best we can. And uh, a matter of fact, Mike didn't bring any product tonight. He, he will have it in the UK and he tomorrow. And also you can go online. Mike? Where is Mike gone? Hey, Mike. He what? Tell, tell them how they can, can get you product. Warnke dot o r g Warnke dot o r g All right Tomorrow night 7:30 in New Caney guys if you don't know where that is get on 2100 go 30 miles take a left to the dead end It's pretty easy Amen. Uh, everybody got an envelope needed one. Amen. Again, be, be serious with you giving tonight. Good to have our guests here, guys. I mean that. I love the town of Dayton. So good to have you guys, Pastor, your friend here. Good to have you guys. Thanks for coming. Amen to all our guests. Uh, well, there will be a skeet shooting, and I, I like skeet shooting, uh, shooting skeet. We, we do it out at the ranch all the time, and uh, it's one of the neat things is having a 110 acres. I had a uh, an AR-15 last uh, Saturday out shooting, and uh, I didn't get anything, but it was still fun to shoot it. And uh, you know, I've shot automatic shotguns. I've, I've done uh, 50 calibers. We 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 shoot musket fire. I like shooting, so we will be there Saturday. Uh, I've invited some from New Caney. I got a few hot shots coming, hey, amen. So you know, I I want to be able to compete in this thing. You know, even if I get knocked out, I want the church to get represented. So uh, uh, you know, so if you uh, would like to come out and be a part of that. That's 8 o'clock, Clay Mounds in Liberty off of what road is that? Texaco Road? Texaco Road. Uh, so as soon as you cross all the bridges there, cover your mouth when you're gone, uh, Cheryl. Uh, you didn't think I caught that, did you? Caught right out of the corner of my eye right there. Uh, see, that's the spirit of Mike getting on me because I'd have never said that. I'd have never said that had that lady right there told him to go away. You know, I'd have never done that. Guys, it will cost money to shoot skeets so bring some money with you, and they will feed you also. Joy Timers meeting, our Just Over Youth meeting, February the 8th, uh, 6 o'clock. Amen. So the ladies, uh, Sharon and, and uh, Carolyn, y'all got together for several hours today going over the things that you're going to do. You'll be here in the Fellowship Hall. It'll be going at the same time. The one in uh, New Caney's going on, the same time here in Crosby, Valentine's Banquet. Uh, we still have a few uh, spaces available. If you'd like to sign up, please come to the Valentine Banquet. You know, it, it was through the Valentine Banquet we found out Jennifer had a husband. <laughs> who actually plays guitar on Sunday in here with us. And uh, we always thought the picture she had was one that she got with her billfold when she bought it. <laughs> we actually met Rob, and from that point, Rob connected with us, and he's always been with us. And so sometimes you just got to make a connecting point that ain't Sunday morning. Sometimes folk ain't coming on Sunday morning, but they'll come to a Valentine banquet or, or something of that nature. So we invite them out February the 14th. Don't forget Muscle Car Sunday, April the 19th. After that, the week after that, we're going to take a blue bonnet run on that next Sunday after that. So if you ride a scooter or you got a convertible, or if your windows roll down and you like sticking your head out, uh, you, you can ride with us as we go toward Brenham and that area. So a lot of things going on between now and summer. We're going to try to get in as much uh, stuff as we can before the camps hit. And then when camps hit June and July, or as we said, Sunday Hoon in Hawaii, it's according if you're from California or not, uh, <laughs> San Jose, uh, anyway, you, you're going to be able to uh, uh, really press in toward the summer. So our year's already rolling. It's going, man, so we're ready for it. God bless you and your giving tonight. And uh, uh, is listen, right behind Dick, move that, that thing right there, that, that bush. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike, you see that hole in the wall? Right above your head. You see it? Okay, you see that hole there? 
I'm going to let people come up and confess to you through their after service. Is that all right? You just, you just stay on that side of the wall. We'll let them come on this side. Okay? Yeah, no, no, you just stay on that side. We'll let them come up and look through there, take pictures of you through there, you know, things of that nature. Be careful of the wire, please, when you walk up there, but you're sure welcome. You think I'm kidding. I'm not. You can walk up there, just don't step on the wire, look at Mike down in there, kind of like a zoo animal, you know what I'm talking about? Amen. Go ahead, guys. Start passing the bucket. Lord, we thank you for the gift and the giver, the opportunity to laugh tonight, to enjoy the presence of God. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is mighty in battle. The Lord is a warrior. Lord of hosts is he. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is mighty in battle. The Lord is a warrior. Lord of hosts is he. Lord of hosts is he. See you Sunday. Good to be y'all here tonight.